Hey everyone, Brian Barletta here from Sounds Profitable, and I'm very excited for this product deep dive. Today we have Sharon Taylor, Managing Director of Triton Digital, and the product we're going to go through is Omni Studio for Enterprise. Sharon, welcome to the product deep dive. Thank you, friend. Good to be here. Yeah, great to be, or great to have you here. And uh, I'm really excited to dig through this. Omni is uh, a really full future platform. I've always had fun uh, experiencing it as a user and working through it on the advertising side too. So I'd love for you to walk us through this. So if you, before we dive in, can you give us like a high level of what uh, you think we're going to dig in? Mm -hmm. Yep. So for those that aren't familiar with Omni, um, like you mentioned, it's an enterprise grade podcast hosting and distribution CMS. So we look after, you know, the largest audio publishers, commercial broadcasters, TV um, around the globe. So kind of a, a wide array of customers. And so today what I want to walk us through is um, kind of a bird's eye view of the platform, digging into some of more of the features that I think make us uh, tick those boxes for our enterprise clients when we're dealing with them. That's awesome. Yeah, so let's dive in. Cool. So um, in front of you and everyone else, you can see my screen, this purple and white um, back end of Omni Studio. And so what we're looking at here is what Omni looks like to a user that logs in that is hosting shows with us. And this screen that they see will change depending on what we call user permissions. Um, so maybe when you log in, you have the right to see analytics or org settings or users. Maybe you can create programs or import shows. Or maybe when you log in, you only get to see the radio jock from the 90s, like Drive, Drive With John, the program that you can tell has been here since the beginning of time when we built this demo <laughs> system out. <laughs> but, um, and what you see changes based on, like I said, those user permissions. And so we have uh, a stack of um, user permissions built into the system, um, and they're done at multiple levels. I'll... I'll edit Aditya's, this poor guy. He needs to start his name with a B or a C so that I don't always like change his permissions. Um, our user permissions are done at multiple levels, an org level, a network level, which in Omni Studio is a way of grouping together various shows, um, a show being like a podcast, like Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend or, you know, My Favourite Murder, um, into groups of shows that um, you can limit to network analytics or user permissions based on that network um, or a program access. And then nested within each of those various permissions, um, you get to tell people whether or not they can manage the content, whether maybe they can only view the analytics, if they can do some combination of all of these things, you know, if they view the audit events, which is another thing that we've built into the system. So quite granular what you can get into here with user permissions and whatever you tick changes what you see. Um, so real quick on that, for the organization, for so the three tiers, organization, network, and program. And so does that mean that one user can have different settings at each of the three levels? Yes, correct. Yeah. So you could have um, uh, a user that is, you know, only able to, in two programs, manage the content for one and the analytics for the other, potentially. Um, but the way that our structure works is that you have to be like one or the other one of the, how do you say one of the other for three? So you can't be like an org level user as well as a program user because those two things are the polar opposite. Like you, if you're an org user, you have access to all the programs. Um, and if you're a network user, you get access to all of the programs within that org, but you can have different permissions based on different networks or programs that you're nested in, if that makes sense. Gotcha. And there's a lot of options there. It can get very granular, it looks like, from full access all the way down to limited to either view or specific actions. Correct. I mean, we deal with clients that have got a wide range of teams, like maybe on the um, business insights team, um, they only want to be given access to analytics. Or maybe if, you know, you've got an external producer working on a single show, you don't want to give them the keys to the kingdom. So um, we find that this kind of granularity really helps. That's great. So... Let me cancel that so as not to get an email from a DTA later. Um, so we're back at um, the org level of, uh, of Omni Studio, and you can see here that we're organised into multiple shows. And so, again, a show being the concept of a, um, a, a podcast, so like Conan O'Brien, all those types of things. Um, one thing I think that is interesting to touch on before we dig too much deeper in Omni, you'll see we've got this um, very premium icon um, where we 
allow people to have um, restricted content access. So this is the notion in Omni Studio of securely distributing certain curations of content to either paying members. Like I know that you're starting to play around with this um, in the Sounds Profitable podcast. Um, and so you might want to give an ad free access to a public feed, a members only feed, um, early access to new content for members. So any of the options that you can see there on the screen. And we've built Omni Studio completely around like APIs so that people can use all the elements of Omni that you would see as we walk through this via an API and maybe never even have to log into Omni Studio. And we've done the same with this secure distribution. So we've built it in a way that it will integrate again via API um, to a publisher's own paywall system. Like we're working with news publishers that obviously have invested a lot of time and energy into their own existing paywall structure. And now they're using this to um, have audio and podcasting as like a layer on top of that. That's, you know, that's really cool. Something I want to specifically call out there is this idea that, um, you know, enterprise, everybody kind of focuses on single sign on, they focus on user permissions, and that's great. Those are really valuable. But I think that we're getting close to the fact that almost every host that's looking at dealing with larger publishers, not even just enterprise has those. This is an enterprise feature here. What this says is that the customers that use this platform likely already have their own payment portal. They have their own sign up. They don't need someone to sign up for their website or for their newspaper or for whatever other specific unique thing that they're already charging them for. And then say, oh, by the way, I have a premium podcast feed that is has a cost to it. Click on this link, get kicked out to a third party and pay again. So this here, this API access is really attractive because it allows users of Omni to take that and embed it into their one single source of, of payment, of collection on that end. So if I'm a listener and I'm a buyer and I go and I sign up for the newspaper, say it's the New York Times or some major newspaper or whatnot, and I click, oh, I'll take the digital subscription. Oh, they have a podcast feed for only plus $5. I click on that, I make one purchase, I'm gonna get my digital subscription and I'm now going to be able to get my podcast feed pulled into their platform instead of having to go to another external source. That is that is an enterprise feature, and that's very cool. Yeah, I mean, everyone's building walled gardens, and we think that our clients should be building their own walled gardens, and our job is to provide the bricks so that they can do that successfully, and this is one of those bricks. So um, we integrate completely with their membership database. We obviously keep um, a UI for... Um, member IDs, but as you can see, everything, we don't want any personally identifiable data in this system. And so all we know is we've got a member ID, which is all linked in through the API for this specific piece of functionality in the system. And it's completely managed on that client side of things so that they're the ones that, you know, rescind the access URL, reset keys, all the rest of it. That's a really, really robust feature. Now, the, the hard part is here is that this is an enterprise feature, which means that it's not something that you're going to be able to just log into and set up in one afternoon. It's not something that you're necessarily going to be able to do all from this one UI. It's intended to be you using it in your complete platform that you have, um, but that's very cool. And the, the focus towards privacy is fantastic. I think that we're entering that age for all of advertising, but podcasting specifically seems to lean into it a lot, um, that privacy focus is really the way to go. So yeah. that's that's very cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could, we do have clients, including uh, Triton. If you're a Triton client, you get access to a quarterly roadmap um, video as well as a podcast version. And we manage that through this system for Triton as well. And uh, I am proud or maybe embarrassed to also say that that's done by a spreadsheet by a person offline and then is um, updated in this system. So it can be done, but yes, the APIs are definitely going to make your life easier in the long run. So yeah, you were just about to explain about uh, playlists, as you call them here, uh, and we were talking about the RSS feed. And so this is really interesting. I like that you can see it in the sidebar here and you can see it in other parts of the platform. Omni has very specific ways of calling things by different terms, right? We call it a podcast, or I call it a podcast, I guess, uh, and enough people do that you put it in parentheses. But mm -hmm. can you explain a little bit more about why uh, you started by calling it playlists and then what, there's another term also that that, that needs a little bit of exclamation. Yeah, so uh, playlisting is, um, back in the day, obviously Omni Studio started and we have a big grounding in radio. So it is a really radio-centric term for those that um, are in that area of the world. 
Um, and we kept it because whilst in very simple ways you can use Omni and any other kind of podcast host out there to have, you know, a single feed for that show. You know, podcasting is the idea of one to many distribution. So you have one feed, it's available far and wide. What we like in Omni is this notion of playlisting, which is the ability to, cre ability to create multiple RSS feeds underneath a single podcast show. And so this is a neat way to curate content. Um, you could um, play traffic up with the with the feed in simplest terms, and you could have one main feed that goes out to Apple and Google and all of those places that pull from the Apple Podcast Library. You could have a specific feed that goes out um, to an owned and operated app that you have. Um, maybe you have an ad-free version of the feed going out, you know, to Spotify or to a different place. Maybe you've got a different curation going to different places that accept a different feed. Or maybe you're using it just as simply as having a curation of content, a, a best of, for instance, of the episodes um, on your own website, which doesn't affect the RSS feed otherwise. So you can kind of get really weird and wonderful with these. You can keep it as simple as you'd like and just have a single feed for each show. Or you can, yeah, like I said, have a different one that you can submit to all those different places, you know, a different version of the ad-free feed that you could push out into your own app or anywhere that you can think of really. I really like this and, and I'm glad you said weird because I think the motto of Sounds Probable now is get weird uh, awesome. because this is so cool, right? Like an RSS feed is thought of as this rigid thing. You create one and you have episodes and you have seasons and you have orders and whatnot. But what happens if you have, you know, 20 episodes, you're doing a weekly show and in the middle of it, you get the idea to do a three part. Yeah. And so now because one feed is set up to be like a daily show and that three part is set up to be like episodic, it, it's hard for people to find. And so you now have the way to create two different RSS feeds. You can leave it in your primary feed because that's how people consumed it. But now you can make one just for your episodic content. Now you can break that out as season one. And when you do that again in your next 20 episodes, it can be season two in the secondary feed. You can submit that feed to Apple ultimately, or in Spotify and all the other partners, ultimately it doesn't matter, right? It's, I think that we're going to see a lot of exploration in the idea of RSS feed customization for the listener in the near future, because I think that that's the equivalent of like really cool landing pages for podcasts. I think that that's where we're gonna see people really kind of flex and try new creative things. So that's neat that it's built right in there. So a playlist, I just go in there, I set a playlist and then clips is what you call podcasts. Uh, and basically I can determine which clips associate with which podcast, uh, which playlist. And can I set that automatically? Is there like a tag system that says this playlist always gets like tag narration and this one always gets tag um, interview. And when a new uh, clip or episode is uploaded, I can set the tag and it automatically knows where to put it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there's two answers to that question. Um, the first is we do have auto ad rules. So you can make curations of content by any number of rules that you um, enter based on the playlist. Um, we also do have an ability to import custom fields if you're using our API. So if you're using your own CMS already internally and you need to tag things on the way into Omni Studio in a certain way, and then we can pull out those custom tags in a curation, in an embed player or a feed that then you can put onto your own website as well. Do all of the clips in a fee in a playlist have to be in my account can i pull them from another feed say you have a podcast and i have a podcast both on omni and we have separate accounts completely am i able to pull your episode into my feed ah interesting question so you could if you import the podcast um but you'd, you'd be better off uh obviously having an agreement with the podcast before yeah. that. We've talked about this a number of times because we look after a lot of clients that like license their content out, like sporting teams to multiple um, orgs. Um, at, the way, at the way it is at the moment, we would rely on those orgs, um, so those clients integrating with our API and you could push it different places. Um, but yeah, that's something that would be awesome to dig into more as, as the product evolves. Yeah, I think we really just scratched yeah. the surface of like, feed drops and episode drops. And this idea of being able to redirect to it, pull an episode in 
so to speak, but redirect to where it originally is located so that the original episode gets all the download, gets all the information, your feed exists as it is, and this content is being pulled in. And you can see the statistics for billing and whatnot, but at the end of the day, like you're not, there's not duplicate content. I think that that's a really interesting thing that I hope uh, comes as a feature in the future. But this is, I mean, this is amazing that you can set these rules and then anybody who uploads an episode as they are following the standard practice of uploading an episode, it's automatically going to populate into those feeds, which you provided great examples, one for your website, one for an, uh, for a specific app, if you own, own your own app, mm-hmm. um, and one for the general distribution. And that's, that's kind of cool. Yeah, correct. So we've got a couple of clients doing some stuff at the moment. Um, so, Um, These are the Omni FM pages. So example of like a client in Singapore that's automatically pulling in any news headlines from multiple different shows and curating them into a single feed that goes out onto their website as well. Um, uh, A curation of like episodes in a climate change podcast network. So they're pulling in a variety of episodes that the producers of each of those individual shows are saying are the best of so they've started building out like a nice kind of curation there as well so you're limited by your imagination really that's awesome um now our nomenclature will stay on that for a second so it's because you did pull out the clips idea so we're now back in this main program of your account we've gone through some playlists um you'll see now that we're looking at kind of an audio repository. So you can upload basically anything into the system as long as it's an audio file. Um, and we have this notion of clips uh, in the system because of that. It's usually like nine times out of 10, it's going to be a fully finished podcast episode, um, but maybe you want to upload you know, a draft piece of audio, which we have the ability to support. Um, maybe it's a, a trailer, maybe it's a raw audio that you just want to live in your audio CMS until it's time to edit it and then re-upload it. Um, so again, you know, this screen, all of your audio will live in and we have kind of like at a glance, you can see if that published setting of this, you know, Richard interview has gone public, whereas some might be like unlisted, others are still private as in they haven't been made um, public yet. Um, and you can also see how many playlists there are uh, added onto as well. Just one in this case. But yeah, if, if you were using the multiple playlists, you'd, they'd all appear in like a block underneath that. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think clip is a good name for it. I mean, we're past the point of episodes. Like you said, a trailer is not necessarily an episode, neither some bonus content, not always an episode. And, um, you know, there is room for smart briefs and all the other quick skills that are out there for one minute digestible content mm-hmm. that might not be a standard episode. So I think clip is a cool way to go about naming that. Uh, yeah, cool. And I weirdly see my name there. So what are we digging into with a? Oh with yeah, that I, um, well I thought it would be interesting, like to go through a really quick process of yeah um, of uploading uh, your episode, and then maybe you know, look, I'll be completely transparent. You don't host with us at the moment, so this is part sales as well. Maybe I can like use <laughs> you by looking at this how amazing it could be. Um, so I pulled this off of your last um, podcast episode. Um, if you're not listening to Sounds Profitable, do go and listen to it because it's great. Um, oh, is this yours? Yes, it does. Um, I'm excited for a world where someone watches my deep dives and doesn't listen to my podcast. <laughs> so we'll retitle this to be something a little bit more appropriate for the audience. <laughs> um, so once the file is uploading, you know, it, it obviously pulls through the metadata. It's everything that you'd expect to see in a good podcast hosting platform, pulls through that artwork, which you can override on the fly if you want to, you know, upload your title, all of your show notes. This is where you would add it into one or more of the playlists that you've got authority to add it into. All of your published settings. Most people are going live straight away, like pushing it to public straight away. But we do have the ability for you to schedule the publish date um, in Omni Studio. And then once it's public, you can even schedule the unpublishing as well. So if you only had the rights to make this guest interview available for a couple of weeks for whatever reason, you can also schedule it to come out of the feed in advance. So I can I can set it to go public. Mm-hmm. I can schedule the public date and schedule the unpublished date at the same time. Not at the same time yet. Ask me in two sprints time. But yes, uh, at the moment you would set it public, and then you'd come back in and schedule the unpublishing. 
that's really neat, right? So that's that's fantastic for um, you know for the Sounds Profitable podcast. One of the things that we're doing is we are only keeping the four most recent episodes live on the main feed mm-hmm. because we're trying to drive people to try out premium feeds. And so being able to do something like that, right, to set it for public and say within four weeks just remove it, correct? Because then it'll exit the rotation and a new episode will come in. That's that is a great way to automate that. So the the same publishing settings, if you are using restricted feeds, you can say that this particular episode or clip of audio is going into the restricted feed. Um, Coming soon will be the ability for it to be restricted for a certain period of time and then schedule the public publishing after that. So to really kind of support that windowing aspect. Um, At the moment, what you would do is you would go through and you would add it to one or more like feeds essentially one of the restricted and then one of the public um but that's coming down the pipe in the next couple of sprints as well and so that's a great way to take advantage of premium feeds in the way of getting content early so it goes to the restricted feed first and then it's available to the public feed afterwards yep yep exactly right um all the things that you need based on how many seasons you're up to season seven now and sounds profitable probably (laughs) episode 400 um there we go you know whether or not you're uh what kind of like content type it is based on, you know, all those juicy metadata tags. Um, We do have other things built into the system, um, the ability to add a default intro and outro. Um, There's a lot of people like yourselves that are doing this um, dynamically on the fly, but we do have the ability for you to upload at a program setting um, the same intro and outro all the time and change those. So useful if you're doing things like um, announcing like a new... um, a new show that's coming out or a tour that you're going on and you want it to top and tail all of the different um, episodes. So that's at the pure zero, zero. And at the actual end of the file, it automatically appends that to everything when you click that. Can you put multiple in rotation? Like, am I able to make more than one uh, intro and outro? No, only one. um, And you can do the transitions and fades between it. For people that are swapping stuff out regularly, they use the campaign manager to dynamically insert them. Makes sense. It's a lot easier. Yeah, That's still a good feature. That's a great way to just have it by default. So if uh, you know, you just want to make sure it's on the sh- all the shows in your network and gets across there very quickly. You can you can do that with a one check. Correct. Yeah, like a lot of um, shows have audio logos and things, and this is an easy way to kind of like maintain that. Um, and then we've got some audio post pro- audio post processing functionality as well. Um, most everyone's doing this in pre production, but we do have clip leveling in the system as well as loudness normalization. So if you're publishing out your show, you know, to Alexa that needs negative 14 and then Google that needs negative 12 or 16, whatever LUF standard um, that's out there, you can do that in Omni Studio as well. Gotcha. So let's um, do that. Oh, don't forget to add your mid-roll ads. You've got to make that Sounds Profitable podcast profitable, Brian. So um, nice little reminder in there for us. Um, Let's go into um, a Martha Stewart fully baked one. Um, So once you've uploaded that into the system and it has become um, public, the gate up here changes. Um, this is demo content, which is why you can see what we have as glance analytics all through the system. Uh, you've done pretty well, 427 downloads so far on this episode. So my mom's cool. real active on these episodes. <laughs> yeah. She's my number one subscriber. Number one fan. Yeah. Um, so now that that's finished processing, um, we can see that the gate up here has changed. And so this is where all of your social sharing options kind of come through in Omni Studio. So we give you that web player URL so that you can share it on LinkedIn, etc. You know, native sharing out to Facebook and Twitter, WhatsApp, got a lot of Southeast Asian clients. We give you an embed player for everything that's within Omni Studio, both at an uh, episode level as well as the playlist level. So for any content that you're curating, um, Everything's set by program settings by default. I mean, you can customize everything on the fly or you can build an entirely custom player with our API um, and you could build something that looks a bit more like this that suits whatever you need on your website. It still pulls out of Omni Studio and all the analytics pull back in. So totally up to you um, completely whether or not you want like a different shape or maybe you won't hurt our feelings if you decide you don't like any of these and just want to use that API. So for the uh, for the custom player or using the API in relation to your player, your web player, are there any added analytics that a, a podcaster or publisher gets by using your player over using a third party or by using an app? 
Yeah, great question. So um, we built consumption analytics into the system a long time ago. A long time ago, we actually built it to track some downloads from Apple Podcasts as well. Um, but that has since been kind of put out to pasture when they released their version of this into Apple. Um, so today, if we control the player, um, so basically because our server is processing the audio second by second, we can do second by second retention. So if you are getting a lot of listens on your website, some of our news clients get like 30% of their downloads from their website because people are so used to going to the website for that um, uh, content. So the audio content follows suit. Um, or if you've got lots of plays, like I said, in your own app or on your own consum on your own player, but you've integrated the consumption API, then you can see that kind of juicy second by second, as well as your quartile listening, you know, your start points, your drop-offs, and then your skips as well. So yeah, definitely... Um, Again, with that walled garden analogy and the bricks, it's good to drive listening. Obviously, get as many listens as you can from wherever you can, but most of our like top-tier publishers are also driving stuff back to their owned and operated properties just to future-proof all of their assets. And along with that comes the ability to get this consumption data, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I think that that's something people need to start taking very seriously. I mean, think about it just from the newsletter space. Everybody seems to be moving off of Substack, even these third-party tools that were allowed or allowing people to quickly kick up newsletters, quick up, kick up podcasts, all these different things, these aggregators, they get all the data for everybody and they're not motivated to share it with anybody. They don't have to. You need them more than they need you. But even a single percentage of your show being on a player like this that gets data, yeah, it's different if they're on a website, on a desktop versus if they're on their mobile phone listening to Spotify, but it's still statistic, you know, statistically valuable and it's something that we can't take for granted. And having that data can allow you to apply it to more of your overall plans, more of how you represent yourself for advertising and success and growth. So this is very cool and this is one reason why people shouldn't sleep on having a player on their site because you don't know every type of listener out there you don't know if you're going to get one or ten thousand plays on your website so Correct. put it up there if if you use a player like this especially one that's going to give you more analytics yeah. um i'm a big fan of that thank you there's other cool things that you can do if you have like a player on your website and um, we've got a um a vast video server integration so you can actually do like a pre-roll video ad as well that plays before the content and you can do that with on-demand ads as well so again for those publishers that have a you know heavy web presence um or even if you don't and you're thinking about it viewers are very used to seeing video pre-rolls before they get to some content and so it's just another added way of like monetizing that in a non-podcast but podcast related um, experience if I record my podcast and have a video component too, as well, can that be uploaded in here and and handled by the player? Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, the video component is basically just like a pre-roll ad that plays before. And so we would connect in with whatever video, like vast server you've got, like DFP is the most prominent one. Yeah. Oh, I meant like in my episode, if I recorded, say, say this was going to be a podcast version as well, and we have the video here, can I host a video podcast with, uh, with Omni so that... Ah. Right, I'm with you now. No, we don't do video um, podcast hosting. We have an integration with Headliner so that people can make video audiograms of their content. Very cool. Yeah, but um, video itself is uh, something that we kind of shied away from. That's not a bad thing. Knowing that you want to focus on audio is a smart move. Uh, and Headliner is a great tool. So being able to integrate that in there pulls in. And that was a great example of what that ad looks like as a pre-roll before you get right back to your player. That was pretty smooth. Yeah, correct. I mean, we, for a long time, we told um, people that we were the Uala of audio, which is like, you know, the video version of it. And then they kind of went bankrupt and got written down to zero on their balance sheet. <laughs> and so we very quickly pivoted to start saying, we are the Bright Cove of audio because Bright Cove is again, like the, well. the machine. Yeah, correct. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So, so like I said, we've got um, headliner integration into the system and we've got transcript integration as well so that you can push out um, and generate a transcript by a couple of machine options we've got or a human-based um, option um, and then like an inbuilt transcript editor so that you can kind of go through, um, tidy things up and like assign speaker labels and things. And again, with that headliner integration, um, you can then use it to put subtitles on the video as well. 
That's very cool. And the transcription, so I can pick either something that you're doing proprietary or are you working with a third party for it? All third parties. Um, so we started out with Amazon um, because we use their CDN and so it was just an easy kind of add onto what we were using them for. And then we also integrate with Speechmatics API um, because they had the most rest of world languages to suit those clients. And then we've got a rev.com API integration as well. So for those that need like the human transcription and that 100% quality. That's fantastic. And for people who use the API for this, you know, they can take that audio, kick it out, and can they provide the transcript back to you in the, the transcript file format? Uh, not yet, but uh, that is a conversation that I had just yesterday, actually. We've got some tricky stuff planned in the space with transcription. Um, we are starting to think about um, contextual advertising and the relationship between text to audio a little bit more deeply. For those that don't know, one of the very, very first products that our company built was something called uh, SoundGecko, which was, you know, 2011, 2012, basically read articles off the internet and converted it into um, into speech. And so we've kind of got a pretty heavy history with that. And whilst the podcast industry is not there yet, like there is some really cool stuff you can do with it if you transcribe or have all the transcription of your audio. And I think we realize that not everyone is going to use an inbuilt. Like they've got their own workflows. Maybe they're using Descript to start the podcast that way. Um, and so, yes, watch this space is the shorter version of the answer. Yeah, and I'm real bullish on um, contextual advertising. I know it's it's so funny to be in 2022 and be like, yeah, back to contextual. It's like, it feels like the whole everybody tried to say they wanted to dig themselves out of. But for podcasting, there's so much value in it. I mean, Correct. it's one of many touch points for, for enterprise partners, right? They have a website, they have a social presence, they have branded material, and they have their podcast, right? So being able to understand the context, not just of that specific episode or their entire show, but of their network, but all the other touch points, taking that into account and then targeting advertisement on that, or even categorizing shows by knowing the bigger demographic footprint from that contextual uh as we continue to go more and more privacy focused, I hope more companies are putting contextual at the top of their list. I agree. And I think it's going to be really interesting for programmatic, especially. I mean, I think that it could be one of those things that increases the quality and hence the CPM available in programmatic advertising for podcasting. It's really early days for that, as you and I both know. But if you could find a better match of an ad in your content based on a transcript that you can upload and help um, surface better ads, then that's got to be good for both your show and the advertisers, right? Yeah. Uh, an example, a uh, poor example that I like to share is that like um, on Welcome to Night Vale, if I got a programmatic ad and it was about like, I'm looking for a new bike, that's awesome. Like if it's all of a sudden like, hey, we got a new bike and it's great for kids to be dragged around on, uh, Oh, you know, first off, drag around is probably not the right word. But well, uh, um, every parent's got their own technique when it comes to cycling. You're fine. But it, but the problem there is that, like, I just lost that spooky, cool vibe. But if it's contextual and they understand the content better and they can match the vibe on it, you know, maybe it's going to tell me about, you know, uh, Fangoria magazine or something like oh, that. Right. Something that's got like a little bit of a tint towards the content, something that fits in more there, because that's the truth of it. it. Even if it's perfectly targeted advertisement, if it doesn't feel like part of the content, it's kind of a kind of where you hit that wall. And especially for podcasters, it's where they reach for the skip button. So very cool that you're focusing on that and that you had a strong background on it. I'm really excited to see what you dig in on, uh, dig in there and definitely we'll have you back for a deep dive on it. But this is cool with the with headliner too. I mean, a headliner allows people to do clips, um, which is great, and it pulls in the transcription too. If I if I'm correct there, so that you can have kind of a video element of a static image and the transcription, and kind of have a full experience if right. you want to share it on social or in the playlist, like you explained. Yeah, correct. Yeah, like I mean, we um, discovery is one of those things that everyone is trying to solve. You know, there are a lot of people that are smarter than me out there that are going to try and solve it. But whatever we can do to help our publishers get further and wider with their shows. Um, so there's cool things that you can do in Omni to facilitate that. Um, you can clone an episode. So the idea that you would have a two hour long podcast as an audiogram that someone's going to sit through on social media and watch, probably not realistic, but um, someone would have the draw card of the content, I'm sure. And so you can do like, think about it like control copy, control paste, um, replicate the audio. Um, and then what you can do once it's 
alive as a new clip is kind of use our, we have a very cut down post audio process of which you're looking at here. And so you can do very simple, like trim in, trim out, split the audio, um, remove ad roll markers that are set at a program setting. And then you've got 27 minutes, still quite long, um, a 12 minute audiogram. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you can go through and find like the best minute, two minute, 30 seconds, you know, you can join multiple pieces of clips together. So if you wanted to, um, get out like a couple of best bits from two recent episodes, and then you can join those together as a whole new piece of audio, create a headline and a video for that, um, or push it out separately onto social media without it necessarily being a part of a playlist or an RSS feed. So you can do all kinds of that kind of stuff in the system as well. Um, this all, this screen is also and where you go. Oh, go on. Yeah, I mean, that's that best of is something that I don't think a lot of people do, but it's so smart, right? Your clips are showing right there. So that's all my past episodes and mm -hmm. sorted. I can search for them and I can still set chapters. I can set pre-roll, mid-roll and uh, post-roll markers. Um, that's really smart because that means that you can make a best of episode very quickly or a highlight reel episode. You can publish it to a specific uh, playlist or you can publish it to your main one. Yeah. Um, that's really flexible. People need to be comfortable repurposing that content or thinking about ways to do that. I mean, the Sounds Profitable podcast and the articles are a great example of that alone. At some point, I can write an article that just condenses like, here's everything we said about prefix URLs. Cool. And then I'll have like a link to four different articles with some stuff pulled in and, and the podcast equivalent too. Yeah. That's great content sometimes. Yeah. Not everybody has been listening to every single episode of your show and it's okay to do clip or throwback episodes. I mean, some for TV shows, some of that is my favorite content. So. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you could think the number of times, like I've got clients in front of me that say, you know, we just, we want to launch a show and they get their marketing team to do all this press around it. And then they never put in an actual audio embed player. Like you can customize an embed player to match the press website that you're going to launch the show on. And this, you can do the same too. Like if you are going to do a retrospective or if you're tackling a topical issue and you know, you've mentioned it in multiple episodes, clip them all together and provide that amazing audio asset to the company that is also asking for content on their website. Um, and kind of like both of you can increase that. Yeah, that's great. Syndicated. Yeah, correct. This screen is also where you'd come through and put your ad roll markers. Like I know that's going to be a question um, that uh, for some reason the hint was in the name of like your podcast and your newsletter, but yeah, to profit, one must have ad markers in their show. Um, and so this is where you would come through, um, add in like a pre-roll, a post-roll, um, if you were offsetting the post-roll by a certain amount, etc. cetera. Um, and this would be how we integrate with uh, Triton's ad server, which we've built our own UI around. But basically these ad markers will request ad files from the ad server for dynamic insertion or from programmatic if you're tapped into that marketplace as well. Very cool. And I assume everything's competitive. So if I set a, a direct sale campaign again at the same level as like a programmatic ad, uh, mm -hmm. the highest price one can win? Correct. Yes. Yep. So we have that's, full that's technology. Really cool. yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's unusual. Oh, go on. Sorry. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I, the thing I want to highlight here is that Omni is a really great uh, podcast hosting platform and the integration with Triton uh, is really powerful, right? Like uh, there are very few companies in the space that are able to have that type of an integration. And so that means that there is, you know, it's not just a vast tag. It's not a relationship like that. It's a, a direct connection. It's able to take in more data and, and deal with it more directly. So I think you, you get a lot of advantage out of that. Yeah, correct. I mean, we've built, so the entire campaign manager, which we can peek at briefly, um, was built based on that powerful ad tech provided to us yeah, by Triton Digital now that we're part of that company since 2019. And so at a glance, you can see how your campaigns are delivering. Um, there's a separate interface for programmatic. Uh, that's not built into this one yet. But again, watch this space for a release coming out in the next month or so. Um, and so, yeah, you can go through, use this interface to manage your campaigns, which is obviously like a larger umbrella of an advertiser that is running an ad campaign with you from a certain um, start date to end date, and then going through and setting up all of your individual flights in, in Omni as well. So our challenge was to take this very powerful and 
complex ad serving product and distill it down in an easy enough kind of way that a podcaster or a podcast network can go through, click some buttons. um, And then, yeah, that priority is what you were talking about. So something with the highest priority, our system will always sell more of, so insert more ads of, um, than something with a low priority. And podcasting in programmatic is remnant by default. So we assume that you're selling more than what the exchange will sell for. Um, But remnant override is coming soon as well. That's pretty neat. And so does that mean that the Omni platform like totally inherited the the Triton digital uh, ad server? So there's the, that's what you fully adapted into the platform? Well, all APIs. The, the theme of this presentation is APIs are great. Um, there will be bad- badges and shirts given out to anyone that writes in and desires one. But no, yeah, all, all based on API. So we built a skin on top of the system. That That is so cool. I mean, I think that we enter into these spaces where, you know, uh, you know, Omni was acquired by Triton. Triton is now acquired by iHeart. You know, there's uh, Spreaker and Vox Nest in this mix here. Being part of a company that's that's growing so big and having so many tools that are built off of APIs and flexibility there, understanding where the strengths are to each of them is going to really allow that big group under iHeart to really thrive, I think, because it means that there's not two competitive products, right? There's not all these different systems that can't talk to each other because they're built solely in a UI and with no thought towards development or customization. So considering the fact that in 2019, you said you were acquired by uh, Triton, and this is fully integrated and it's been accessible for a while now, that, I mean, speaks volumes to the fact of the growth we're gonna see out of iHeart because of the adaptability of this team and and the bigger Triton family. Yeah, it's our job to be really thoughtful about what we can provide as tools to the wider podcast community um, and how we're best to build things based on everything at our disposal. Um, And so, yeah, so uh, if, if APIs are not the theme of this, talk it's watch this space because there are going to be some interesting things coming you could just rename let's just that's what the the thing will be named brian like apis and watch this space watch well, I, roll in but i like that too i mean you're talking about features that you're actively working on you're talking about things that are relevant at the time of a recording this that need to come out that yeah. that are things that you know the other competitors or whatnot might have similar or might be working on it but these aren't like lagging features or anything they're thoughtful increased features and that's really something that i want to drive home to enterprise clients there are so many amazing hosting platforms out there period the next part of the sentence is there is a very limited number of actual enterprise platforms. And enterprise truly means you're not sitting for six months on a feature request for something that should be pretty standard to be done through an API. And so that's really what we have to emphasize here. uh, Enterprise really means that the publisher wants to do whatever they want to do in the platform that makes sense within podcasting. and me and wants that level of control and ownership on it. And so platforms built with this mindset are pretty rare. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it is very cool that this is the mindset that uh, Triton and Omni have taken. And it's, I, I really believe that it's going to be interesting and very competitive with iHeart uh, now acquiring you. Um, and so we've gone through campaign creation. Mm-hmm. We've gone through uh, the podcast creation. We've done the premium feeds. Do you want, uh, oh, and also the organizations, which was very cool. Do you want to kick over to reporting to tie it all up? Yeah, I think so. Because, I mean, what's the point of all of that if you don't know how everything is performing. Um, so yeah, let's let's wrap it up with analytics. So we do analytics at a multiple level, um, like our user permissions. So at an organization level, at a network level, so you can group those shows together, at a program or show level, at a playlist level, so you can drill into how each of the different feeds perform, and then at a clip level as well, or an episode level. Um, all the UIs are largely the same, so let's look at program analytics. Um, we do seven days by default, but you can pick any date range, including lifetime through here, um, change the cadence and the time interval of how you would like the data displayed. We give you that clip download during the period, um, as well as like a compare from last week. Obviously, everything you're seeing is IABV2 filtered and certified um, so that you can trust the numbers uh, are showing you what you need to be shown. We bring through that IAB listener metric, which is that combination of uh, IP address and user agent. And then we've also got um, the kind of original reach metric of just IP addresses as well. Moving through, we give you everything that you'd hope to see. So all those clip downloads over time in a trend graph um, broken down by date, 
depending on what level you're looking at analytics from, you'll see, you know, in your org level, you'll see the most downloaded networks and programs. Because we're looking at programs here, you obviously only see the nested um, levels below that. So uh, clips, as well as like the most downloaded playlists. So those sources, most everything's going to come from your playlist RSS feed. But if you are sharing lots of audio around to embed sites, uh, you can track the embed player um, or you can pull this through into Google Analytics as well. We've got a, a widget for that if you want your Business Insights team to not even touch Omni, even just on the analytics screen. All the things you'd hope and expect to find, right? Like so all the most downloaded apps, um, including that split out between the different Apple user agents, um, Spotify, etc. all the platforms, devices, your device type, and a geography broken down by city and state. Um, you'll see everywhere that you can export to CSV. Um, and then we also have a full log export product, um, which allows you to pull the process logs out of Omni Studio so that you can, again, you're not going to hurt our feelings if you don't like the way that our analytics are, are put together. You can build your own um, and slice and dice the data however you'd like. And that's also really good for working with prefix partners or uh, attribution partners now. You sign a uh, data processing agreement and you provide them those logs mm -hmm. instead of being in a situation where you um, you know, put a prefix URL or do an attribution tag. So that's really cool that that's available. Um, one of the things that you said there that we kind of glossed over real quick is you can kick this data out to Google Analytics. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, we can kick out the embed uh, data out into Google Analytics so that you can tie it in with your web platforms. But we did recently also update our log export functionality so that you can look at it. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, this is great data. Um, and, and you're right, it's, it's the standard stuff that we're, we're all looking at. It's neat that it's visualized. It's great that you can do it as CSV. It's also available all through the API. Um, but is there forecasting? Ah, there is, yes. Let me go back into our managed ads. So again, based on the rugged Triton ad platform that we've um, integrated into, um, you can go through and you can look at and pull a forecast report. So based on a date range, your ad placement selection, um, you need at least one program put in there. And then we can generate that forecast report. And the forecast report takes about 28 days to learn your download patterns in the system. But then it starts saying, OK, we expect you to be able to have um, 57,000 available or you know, forecast 80,000 total. And then how many have not got a contending ad flight already booked? So how many don't have ad markers, essentially? And so you can kind of start looking out how many available impressions you'd have over you know, as many programs that you've selected. And then with one click of a button, create a flight to fill those impressions um, based on yeah, your 28 day rolling fluctuations in the downloads. And that takes into account direct sold and uh, programmatic? Uh, it takes into account direct sold, programmatic because um, like it takes into account all 28 days of past downloads, regardless of whether they had an ad filled by dynamic or programmatic. Like that's something that we obviously can learn from in the system. Um, programmatic because you're not booking your programmatic campaign. Gotcha. And so it doesn't know how many contending flights are going to be filled. Like if you do nothing, um, maybe all of these um, available impressions are filled programmatically if you've got it as backfill, you know, depending on the advertisers and all of the demand and supply. Otherwise you can 100% book it out knowing that you're selling a campaign from an advertiser direct. Gotcha. I didn't know if it did anything to show like estimated fill for uh, programmatic. So if, if it's a slump or, or, you know, it would be awesome if it did. Programmatic is too fluid. I mean, yeah. Yeah, way too fluid. And I mean, we see things like I'm based in Australia. We see the Australian government just one day decide to tip a ton of money into programmatic based on like um, the flu vaccine um, was really big, obviously. And so it can change second to second, which is both the beauty and the peril of programmatic advertising. Very true. But that makes sense why you set it as a uh, remnant to start uh, so that the intention is direct sold first, which is uh, the priority of pretty much every enterprise company out there. Uh, yeah. And then uh, assistance through programmatic. Correct. Yeah. And our fingers on that pulse, you know, like we are watching it really closely to see when the winds start changing um, a little bit faster towards programmatic, not being a second class citizen and people starting to do more private marketplace deals, you know, with one of the trade desks. Um, and in that case, when that happens, we want to be ready to go, OK, well, that over here has changed. Um, and so we need to jump on it in terms of what is available in this UI. But right now, you're right. Like most everyone is selling 
their own stuff and it's always direct sold is going to, you know, outweigh programmatic. Yeah. One day, watch, that's prediction. One day we'll have a different, we'll, we'll be having a whole one about these, all about programmatic and how direct sold was a thing of the past. You know, no, I, probably, I, probably not, but maybe. I think contextual is really going to drive that difference. I think that when right. programmatic can fit in and feel like a piece of content instead of like a potential disruption while targeted heavily towards the listener, sometimes, you know, programmatic can feel like, um, like a, a, a break, an ad break, right? And I think that uh, it has tons of value. I think it performs very well. Um, but the second it stops feeling like an ad break and starts feeling like content is that tip. And I don't think we're that far from it. And I think out of all the industries to really be able to drive that home, I think it's going to be podcasting. I agree. I mean, some of our clients are starting to do it like between their shows within an organization, um, you know, inserting news updates and things. I don't think we're that far off, you know, a news publisher in one region of the world selling their news updates geographically into a publisher that has a good download amount in that in that geography as well um there's a lot of stuff that we can do um we just need i just need i just need the industry to catch up to where all the things i want to build brian that's what i need I'm right there with you. I think we're going to build some cool things. Look, I think, I think that this is a great platform. And I think the thing to emphasize is every single thing that we walk through here can be done through an API. That is an enterprise platform. I really want to drive that home. This is the type of thing that like, if you log in and you host your show on there, there are cool bells and whistles, but the, the real, like really opening it up is that API, really tying it into your complete solution, really making it a part of your radio solution or your, uh, you know, your new solution or whatever you sell, whatever your main content channel is, or podcasting is big enough. And you realize intelligently that you should own every single piece of interaction that you can get your grubby little hands on. Like you super should do that. It's really important. I mean, that's why I did the premium feed. I want want to know when Sharon downloads what episode. And I want her to tell me that's okay. So this level of connection, this level of interaction is the type of thing that is going to allow everybody to create their own walled garden, as Sharon said. And that's not a bad thing because yeah. those walled gardens teach people this is how we interact with it. Podcast is part of a uh, like a, a bigger package, right? It's a, it may be the primary piece of it. It might be an add-on, but you know how to interact there and you don't feel like, oh, when I buy something, podcasting is like an add-on in the sense that you have to go completely somewhere else to go purchase it. So this is very cool. This is very publisher first. I'm very excited to walk through it. And I'm excited for, you know, next year, me and you to make some predictions and hopefully uh, do this about programmatic. Yes. Yep. Next year we'll do this again. Everything will be different. It won't be purple. It'll be red (laughs) or something. Yeah, correct. Yep. There we go. Well, thank you so much for joining me on here. Uh, If anybody wants to, you know, try out the Omni platform, um, you know, is there anything we can offer them to to give them a, you know, a sneak peek into it or a month free or something like that? Yeah, sure, Ken. If you send an inquiry into sales at omnistudio.com and mention that you uh, watch this and that's how you found out about us, um, we will offer 20% off of the monthly price. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. And, uh, you know, thank you everyone for watching this. Thanks, guys.